We are next going to hear from Carlo Rotti from MIT's own Media Lab from right here. Carlo is the uh, director of the Sensible City Lab, which is investigating ways to use sensors and devices to uh, improve urban living. And so he will tell us all about it. Great. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Um, good morning, everybody. It's a great pleasure to be here with you this morning. If you can just get the slides on and then. Uh, so I, I want to talk to you. Um, people talk a lot about smart cities. We actually like to call it more like sensible cities. That's, uh, that's the name of our lab here on the MIT campus. And I wanted to start really with the beginning. Uh, the beginning, like, you know, 1990s, uh, people thought that our life would become more and more virtual. So much so that some people like Gilder, um, in 1995, you know, 1995 is the same year that Nicolas Negroponte wrote Being Digital. So a little over, uh, so uh, then thought that because of digitization, then our cities would disappear. This is Gilder says, we are headed for the death of cities. Cities are leftover baggage from the industrial era. Well, this tells you how difficult it is to predict the future, because no prediction could have been more wrong than this one. We've heard today, you know, cities have been thriving. That's a picture from Tianjin in China. China is planning to build more cities than all of humanity ever built so far. And uh, we also know that by 2030, we might have up to 5 billion people living in cities. So what has happened is that all of these digital connected layers haven't killed physical space, but actually the digital and physical are kind of recombining in a new way. It's almost like the world of bits and the world of atoms coming together. It's almost like cities becoming like computers in open air. And that is radically changing, actually, the way we can sense them, the way we can collect information from them, the way we can design them, plan them, and ultimately, the way we can, we can live in them. And this is really what we look at here at the Sensible City Lab. And I wanted to share with you, you know, a few examples that are divided into two components. One about sensing, how today we can collect information from cities in a very different way, and then actuating, how that information can help us to actually make different decisions. The first project I want to share with you um, deals with uh, that computer up there. Uh, you know, that computer is made of every chip in that computer, you can actually trace it. You know very well the global supply chain. You can see where it was produced, how it moved on the planet, how it became that machine. However, a few years from now, when you throw away that computer, uh, you know very little about it. Sometimes this is what happens to it. A lot of e-waste illegally gets where it shouldn't go. So our idea was, well, what if we could actually develop a little tag and put the tag on trash and then follow trash and see where it goes? We did this project with Qualcomm, um, and you know, we had to engineer with them this, uh, this little tag in programming. Um, I'll show you the first deployment we did in the city of Seattle. 500 people, volunteers, and 3,000 pieces of trash. We put a little tag on all of them. And after tagging them, we started following them. So you can see the day of deployment in Seattle. After a few days, you see some of the main landfills next to Seattle. But then a big surprise. Actually, how far some stuff started to travel. Sometimes in a crazy way, look at that, all of the trash from the west to the east, and look at the trace that went from Seattle to Chicago and down to, to Baja California, in, you know, with thousands and thousands of wasted miles and still moved, moving after one month or two months. We thought there was a right piece of music. <laughs> so, so anyway, so um, what can you do with this if you got all this information? Well, if you're an engineer, you can take all this information, you can actually analyze it, process it, and then you can perhaps design a much more efficient waste management system. You know, you can save a lot of energy by moving things around in a more efficient way. The other important thing is, as we heard before from Catherine, is actually if this information is shared with people, then it can promote behavioral change. If this huge amount of data, this part of big data that's mostly produced in cities, is actually shared with all of us, then we can actually make better decisions. Something interesting was at the end of the project, somebody came to us and said, I used to drink water in plastic bottles every day and throw away the bottles and forget about them. But actually, after the project, I can't forget about them anymore. I know they go a few miles from home to a landfill. They will stay there forever. So I stopped drinking water in plastic bottles. 
There's a third thing we discovered, actually, uh, that was unexpected. It happened here at the MIT campus a few, a few months ago when a burglar came to our lab, installed a lot of things, including some of the tags that tell you where they go. <laughs> and this is what happened. Well, this was just one example of sensing, how today we can sense a lot of things. You know, there's many other ways. I'll go very fast here. But you know, what you see here, for instance, is the city of Lisbon sensed through billions and billions of data coming from the taxi night for GPS information. You can do the same with cell phone information. So today we can sense our space, our cities, in a, in a, in a much different way. Now, the important thing, however, is actuating. How can we use all this information in order to promote action, enact action into the city? One important thing, we saw it before, is uh, you know, how people can use this information, use this data, and then change their behavior. That's one way of actuating. There's many other ways. Analysis of big data is a very important one. This is a project we're doing in New York City, where we're looking at all the taxes, what you see is drop-offs and pickups in New York City. And then we're asking ourselves, so. Just a theoretical question. Imagine you could design a different system, a system that's based on um, uh, sharing a taxi. Could be bigger taxi, could be minivans, but you know, that allow people to share. Something you couldn't do before because you didn't have a real-time information in your pocket, in your, on your phone. So what if you could actually do that? And then what would be the minimum number of taxis actually to take people to their destination exactly in the same time, plus, plus or minus like a couple of minutes? So that's the idea. If you try to do that, then you ask your question, you know, what is the minimum number of taxis you could use on the system to actually provide the same mobility offer? And what it turns out, if you look at these graphs, is that actually with 40% less taxis, New York City could actually take everybody to destination at the same time. And if you, if you turn those taxis into minivans, you get something interesting that's in between public and private transportation, but actually providing a very, very good actually mobility service that responds you know, to people and go and picks them up when they need it. So not buses that we need to follow, but buses that follow us. Now, this is about all of the information we can collect from our cities, but our cars as well are being turned into incredibly powerful sensing machines. And in this project, for instance, we are using sense information inside the car to see the condition of the driver. Just finished the drive. It was incredibly stressful. It was the most stressful drive I've ever been on. Nevertheless, I think we have a lot of great content to measure road frustration because I'm certainly frustrated at this point. And here we are. 
car? So we were just side swiped. Um, and right now my stress level should be through the roof. Um, we got the information, you know, we'll have to process the data and, and see where it's really at. Kyle is a, is a research assistant in the lab, so after he sideswiped the car, we said, well, now you need to jump out of the plane to, to compare it. Well, you know, you got all this information from the city, all this information from inside the car, and you combine the two, and you get to one some of the most exciting things that's happening today, which is self-driving cars. As you know, Google has developed one, MIT has a few prototypes, other universities and companies are developing some. What you see is here is actually a 3D model collected in real time from the self-driving car in order to navigate space. But when you got self-driving cars, it's interesting, because then you totally blur the distinction between private and public. The car can give you a lift in the morning to go to work, and then can go and give a lift to somebody in your family or somebody else, anybody else. So, or the other thing is that you can think about a city where you have no traffic lights anymore. A city where flows of traffic actually magically mix without bumping into each other, like this. Um, don't try this today yet. Uh, but uh, but you know, then, then the whole thing about the city changes. And you know, self-driving or autonomous vehicle also can be applied to many other things. A couple of weeks ago, we, we were confronted with the beginning of the semester here on the MIT campus, and uh, we actually start, we have a project on drones, and we said, well, you know, we should do something. You know, MIT is difficult to navigate. You might have found out today or yesterday. You know, every number, every room has a number. You know, it's difficult to orient oneself. Uh, that's particularly tough for Harvard students. So we de <laughs> we we de we developed this project. <laughs> Welcome to MIT. Where would you like to go? Follow me, please. Just research lab at MIT. To your right, the media lab. To your left, research. the Stata Center. Follow me, please. Approaching your destination. You have arrived. Welcome to Sensible City Lab. I'll stop it here. If any of you is interested, there's actually a demo sky call uh, just outside, and I think we, we can have the, the discussion now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Stay here. Yeah. So, so it's good to stay here for a second. We're going to bring everybody else up. Uh, yeah. Let me. Let me um, was that a real Harvard student or an actor? <laughs> I, I'll tell you something even worse. Um, uh, he's called Matthew. He's from Yale. And he was very, <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and, and he was very happy to play the dumb Harvard student. <laughs> so let me. What you showed is very cool, very exciting. Let me try to pin you down a little bit, though. What do you think are some of the actual, the biggest problems that technology could solve in cities over the next? 
30, 40 years. Well, you know, if you look at this, the convergence between physical and digital, then you can apply to most things. You can apply to energy, to water, to waste management, to uh, traffic, you know, you name it. Really, most of the things about our cities. At the same time, I think there's going to be also a lot of challenges. And, you know, I think out, out of all the challenges, I think two in particular. The first one is that, uh, you know, if you're building a car that's like a computer on wheels, you know, we were familiar with computer viruses. And in the old days, you get a computer virus, and then you stop working for a few hours, and that's fine, but nobody would die. But imagine just a small virus that does something simple, just you know, switches the pedal with a brake, and then, then you're in trouble. So I think what we're we are doing is that, as, uh, you know, as, as engineers, we will say we're building cyber-physical systems. And the problem, they're exciting. They, you, know, you can do a lot of things. We can optimize the city. Most importantly, we can bring people inside the system so we can use feedback loops, based human feedback loops, like we, we heard today. But the issue is that also you know, there's an issue about how reliable are they? What happens is actually if, uh, if your city gets hacked, and, you know, and to which extent? And then I think that's one of the things we need to look at. Another aspect, I think the other thing um, that we need to look at is about data and all this incredible amount of data, which is great, but also it uh, can also pose uh, privacy issues. So that's another thing we need, to, we need to be very careful about. All right, well, we'll talk about that and some other things. So, Colin, please yep. join us here.